Good morning. So we're going to start with our reading from uh, Nehemiah 2. Uh, hopefully it should appear on the, the screen so you can follow it through. And we're in the Old Testament, so there's bound to be a few names that uh, we stumble over. But let's, let's give it a go. So in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of kin, King Artuk Xerxes, when wine was bought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judea where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judea. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Senballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for him in Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, But there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I'd gone or what I was doing. Because as of yet, I'd said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sembalat, the Heronite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, And Geshem the Arab heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. The word of God. Amen. So yeah, last week, clear set the scene for us and the context of this book of Nehemiah. And we learned in chapter 1 how Nehemiah, one of the king's most trusted and closest servants, was really deeply troubled by the state that he found Jerusalem in. And this prompted him to turn to God in prayer. And he called out to God again and again in fervent prayer. And in his lament, he felt compelled by God that he should return to Jerusalem 
to repair and rebuild the city walls. Walls that had remained broken and destroyed for many, many years, despite attempts previously to repair them. And as we read on through this book, we'll discover that prayer alone is not enough to bring about change. It's not enough to build the kingdom of God. Prayer is just the starting point for action. But we don't go alone. We go with God by our side. And so this chapter that we read is split into two segments with a broad outline of three significant events. First, we have the approach by Nehemiah to the king who sends him into Jerusalem, verses 1 to 8. And then in the second part, in verses 9 to 16, we see him inspecting the broken city walls. And then finally, in the closing verses, we see Nehemiah proposing to rebuild the wall. And so in the short time we've got available this morning, we're going to briefly look at those events. But we can't cover it all. So I do encourage you this week, go and read the whole chapter, get some study materials and have a look and dig a bit deeper because there's some fantastic stuff in there. So we open being told that it's the month of Nisan. Now, I'd not a clue what Nisan means. I don't know, anybody want to offer? Yeah, so. Better known today would be kind of March and April, between March and April. And it's a significant date, really significant date in the calendar. So previously, if we back to chapter one, we were told it was a Kislev, around about November, December. So this is some three, four months later. But this date is significant, and probably the reasons it's mentioned is because it's around the start of the Jewish New Year. As we read in Exodus 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of the year. And so it's likely that this would have been a time of celebration. Most likely why we see that there's wine being served and there's wine free-flowing. And so I think it's fairly safe to assume that it would have been a jovial time. And when we have a jovial time at New Year, don't we? I think the Jewish were no different. I think they had a jovial time at the start of the year. But Nehemiah, he was sad. And so it's no wonder that the king picked up on this. At a time when everybody should have been happy, Nehemiah was clearly sad in his presence. And his sadness stemmed from the deep pain that he felt for Jerusalem. And this had been troubling him for now several months. So it's no wonder that the king picked up on his mood. Nehemiah clearly didn't feel in the mood to celebrate. And in his writing, we discover that not only is Nehemiah honest with himself, honest with God, but he's also honest with us, the reader, in how he's feeling. In that immediate moment, I was very much afraid. And he had a right to be afraid because Kings at that time were very different to kings of today. They didn't want to be troubled by their servants' problems. The servants were there to serve the king, not the other way around. They didn't want to hear what problem he got at home. That was to be left at the castle gates. But they're not important enough. Nehemiah would have known this. So he would have known he was in grave danger, exposing this sadness. The king could have fired him. Even worse, he could have him executed. But in this moment, God had answered his months and months of prayer. Because God had created an opportunity for Nehemiah to speak up, to speak out over everything that was troubling him. But it called in this moment for Nehemiah to be brave. You know, as as we read this, perhaps we need to question ourselves. How often do we find ourselves in the situation where we know we should speak up, where we know as God's people we should intervene, 
or stand up for what is right. But we bottle it. Yeah, I've done that. Definitely. I'm sure I'm not alone. Sometimes we're called to be brave. You know, perhaps that's sharing the gospel. Making sacrifices for the betterment of God's kingdom. Confronting sin. Speaking up against peer pressure or speaking out against the evils in society. Yet here, in this scripture, yet again as we do many times in scripture, we find a person willing to risk their life to do what God was asking of them. And fear is a natural reaction. You know, we can't control it. It's perfectly natural. But what we can control is our response to it. And how does Nehemiah respond here? He doesn't freeze. He doesn't panic. He doesn't apologize for his sadness and beg for mercy. All of which would be, you know, perfectly reasonable responses. No, we see here how Nehemiah moves past his fear to do what God wants him to do. And first he, he pleases the king, doesn't he, with, the, with these words. May the king live forever. Long live the king, as we might say today. You know, as I read that, I couldn't help but ask the question, which king was he referring to? Because it's easy to assume, isn't it, that he's declaring his loyal support for Artaxerxes. But we know, from what we've discovered so far, that Nehemiah's God, his true king, is the king of heaven. We know from his prayer that God is the one he truly serves. So perhaps it was God he was referring to. But this declaration proves the way for him to share his plan with the king. And after that, he does something else that is even more audacious. He dares ask the king, almost challenges him. Well, why shouldn't I be sad? Why shouldn't I be sad? Look at what's going off. And again, yet again, God paves the way with a response that's totally unexpected. There's no doubting that God was in the room with him at this time. The king asks him, what is your wants? What do you want? And with this, we see another answer to prayer. An answer to the prayer that we read in chapter 1 as he cried out to God, over the situation he discovered in Jerusalem. So God first answers his prayer by creating an opportunity to share his pain, to share the issue, whilst at the same time granting him compassion in the sight of the king. And at this point, it'd be really easy for Nehemiah to think, right, I've got it, let's get in. Let's get my request in now. I've got the king's attention. Let's get this wall rebuilt but you know he doesn't forget himself or who has called him to the task in hand and so again in the very heat of the moment we see him turn to God for wisdom and guidance with one more prayer it's instantaneous it's quick and it's probably silent Nehemiah was a man that knew the value and power of prayer and we can learn from that example. We too should rely on God all the time. God wants to see us rely on him through prayer, consistently, in the big and the small. And yes, you know what? It's okay for those quick prayers. It's okay to call out in desperation, God, help me. But truthfully, if we want to build a good and healthy relationship with our Father, we also need to dedicate times of private prayer, as Nehemiah did, not just times when we're in immediate and desperate need. It was because of Nehemiah's dedication to prayer that he found himself now in the situation where his prayers were being answered. And I think at this moment, I think the penny dropped with Nehemiah. I think he knew God was with him at this very moment because what happens next is truly astounding. It's beyond brave. Because, you know, logically... His next request doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 
Why would a king want to potentially help build another city? A city that may become a threat to their own power and authority. A city that may, in the future, rebel against them. And let's not forget, this was the same king who had ordered the wall not be rebuilt, as we found in the book of Ezra. I issued an order and a search was made, and it was found that this city has a long history of revolt against kings and has been a place of rebellion and sedition. Jerusalem has had powerful kings ruling over the whole of trans-Euphrates and taxes, tribute and duty were paid to them. Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. But you know, by now, Nehemiah's confidence, it was off the scale. And this wasn't a self-confidence. This was a confidence of what was possible with God. And that should encourage us too. You know, the Baptist uh, missionary, um, William Carey, he said, attempt great things for God. Ask great things of God. Is that something we do as individuals on a regular basis? Is that something as a church we're willing to do? So by now, Nehemiah is really going for it. He's come this far and he's succeeded. He's, he's had everything he's, he's asked for. But you know, he's just going to give one final push. He's just going to push a little further to him get a little more. And so he asks for letters of protection so they can be handed to the local rulers of the lands he will pass through. And he succeeds. His request is granted. But still he doesn't stop. Not only does he want the king's blessing and protection, but he wants the king to pay for it. I mean, this guy's got some front. And he asks for a letter that he can give to Asaph to obtain materials to rebuild the wall. And lo and behold, what happens? He gets it. You know, we see something of Nehemiah here in these last three or four months. They haven't just been spent dwelling and worrying about the problem. He's clearly spent the last few months planning the whole thing. You know, he's worked out how long it's going to take to get there. He's worked out what challenges he's going to have on the way. He's worked out he's going to need materials. And he's also worked out where to get them from and who's going to pay for them. I tell you what, wow. I want to meet this guy. We need more Nehemiahs. We we truly do. This is a man who gets things done. But note his recognition. Amongst the success of achieving all that he'd set out to achieve, Nehemiah tells us it was because the gracious hand of God was upon him. No proudful boast, no self-indulgence, that simple recognition that this was the work of God. And it was with this that he had the confidence to set out on his mission. And it's so often the case when God is on the move, there are forces that push back against that good work. And we see it here in Scripture. I'm sure some of you will have experienced that in your ministry work. It could be negativity from others. Ah, don't bother doing that. You won't get anywhere. It could be resistance It could just be things getting in the way and taking your time, preventing you from getting on and doing the things that you know God wants you to do. It's nothing new. Evil forces will always seek to prevent what is good. And we see it here. It isn't long until Nehemiah meets his first opposition in the form of Sambalat and Tobiah, perhaps threatened by both the sight of the king's men he's come with and the threat posed to the Samaritans, by the Israelites strengthening their city. And as we'll discover in the coming weeks, it won't be the last we hear of these two. So after a journey of around 1,000 miles, which probably took several months, Nehemiah finally reaches Jerusalem. And having arrived, we really spent three days recovering. Now some commentators suggest that he spent this time to rest. And that would make sense. He's got a big job ahead of him. He's just had a weary journey. I think it'd be a pretty good idea to get some rest. But you know, having read about him these last couple of chapters, I don't think he just spent time in rest. 
I think it's safe to assume that there was probably a combination of rest, prayer, and planning and preparation. And so having arrived quietly and without a fanfare or cause for attention, Nehemiah went out to recce and survey the wall. He wanted to be sure that the plans he'd made would be a success. There wouldn't be any last-minute problems that might get in the way. And again, we can learn from this too because sometimes we want to just rush in, don't we? We want to rush in, get it done. Get a quick win. And I'm sure that, you know, with all the frustrations of over how long it had already taken him to get to where he was now, that Nehemiah was keen to get going, keen to get started on rebuilding the wall. But he was calm and he was measured. And so for us too, sometimes we become frustrated at the progress of things, both in our personal lives and at church. Let us not let that frustration lead us to rush in. We need to be encouraged to take our time to survey and plan, as Nehemiah did here, particularly before making important decisions. We need to make sure we have all the information we need with God's help. But also here, we see a clear example of leadership. Nehemiah went out secretly because he wasn't yet ready to share his detailed plan with everybody else. He wanted to be sure that when he did share that plan, that he had answers to all of their questions that they were likely to ask. He checked every single detail, being sure to leave no stone unturned. He wanted to ensure that he could lead those people with confidence, have their trust and unwavering support to ensure they accomplish their task. He did everything he personally could to play his part, ensuring he wouldn't fail God. And then finally, we see the execution in verse 17 of the wall being built. As Nehemiah is ready to execute his plan, he shares his vision with the people. You know, and I'm sure that his speech was one of inspiration. I think it was one of motivation because he clearly knew how to get people on board and how to motivate them. Look, look where we find ourselves. Our city is a mess. Look at it. Look at the trouble we're in. Is this what you want? It doesn't have to be this way. Come on, we can take action. We can change the position we find ourselves in. We can make a better life for ourselves. Instead of being disgraced, we can be respected. Hey, and you know what? This isn't something you're going to do alone. We're going to do it together. We're going to do it together with God. And in the King James translation we read, they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. In other words, they stopped what they were doing. They stopped being complacent. They got up. They stopped doing nothing and they took action. And they were unified in their response. And this didn't go unnoticed. It very clearly troubled the two officials who also now had a third member of their gang, Geshem the Arab. As they said to them, what are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And again, Nehemiah stands by God in his response. The God of heaven will give us success. And so the challenge for us as we respond to what we've heard, as we seek to live out our lives for Christ and our visions and values as a church, what is it that God wants us to build? Because we all have something to build for God, individually, 
and corporately. We can and we should make plans. Not on our own, but with God's wisdom, God's guidance. And we do that through times of prayer and reflection. You know, it's easy to sit down and do nothing. But God is calling us to rise up. He's calling us to action. And so we must prepare ahead for the plans and tasks that God has in store for us. And finally, we should give glory to God for the results. Because the credit is ours. It's all his. Let us pray. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for the example that you give to us through Nehemiah. Lord, we thank you for the challenges that it poses in our own lives. Lord, would you reveal to us in times of prayer and meditation the plans that you have for us. Lord, give us the confidence, give us the encouragement to set about those plans. Lord, when we just think of that horse unable to get through the wall because it's just a pile of rubbish. You know, sometimes we may look at ourselves like that. Sometimes maybe we see ourselves as broken. A pile of rubble. Thinking, what can we do? But Lord, just as you provided that new timber to rebuild that wall, you provide us with everything we need to rebuild our lives. So Lord, would you take those old pieces of rubble, put it with the new. Would you build us and build your church? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. It isn't a mistake that we picked Nehemiah for this time and season for us as a church. And over the next few weeks, we're going to really be reflecting on some of the passages from Nehemiah as we think about what is God asking us to do. There's lots of different things we could do as a church, but what is he asking us to do? How do we weigh it up? How do we make sure we've got the resources and what we need? And how do we each play our part in that? So please do be praying for us. And if you're a member, please do come to the members meeting when we talk about that a bit more as well. Um, but in all these things, like Chris has highlighted, um, Nehemiah didn't just have his own plan and go off on his own way. He was following God. He was following God lead, God's leading. And so we're going to finish with a song now, um, which really reminds us that God is our shepherd and that is, he is the one that we want to follow in his voice alone. So if you're able, um, please do stand and sing with us. <laughs>